Now that we've looked at thermal radiation, it's time to put that into a larger context by discussing different kinds of spectra. We usually divide spectra up into three main types, continuous, emission, and absorption. A continuous spectrum is one that goes through a series of colors with no gaps or jumps. Thermal radiation is the most common example of a continuous spectrum. Even though thermal radiation is emitted light, it doesn't produce what we call an emission spectrum. Emission spectra are produced when you heat up a thin, transparent gas. The light it produces isn't a continuous rainbow. Instead, it's made up of a discrete set of bright colors called emission lines. There may be just a few lines, or the spectrum may look like a barcode, depending on what gas is emitting the light. When we look at a glowing nebula in the night sky, we're often seeing an emission spectrum. An absorption spectrum is the opposite. Instead of bright lines on a dark background, it consists of dark lines on a bright background. Absorption lines are formed when a continuous spectrum, such as that from thermal radiation, passes through a thin gas. The gas absorbs light at very specific colors, producing the dark lines. An example of this happens when we look at the light from the sun. The sun's surface produces a thermal spectrum, but then the light passes through the sun's atmosphere, and later it passes through the Earth's atmosphere. Both of these produce absorption lines in the sun's spectrum when we observe it from Earth. Each chemical element and each compound has its own pattern of absorption and emission lines. This pattern is the same whether you're seeing it in emission or in absorption. These act as a sort of fingerprint, telling us which gases are present. So when we look at the spectrum of an object, one of the most important things we can learn is the object's composition. Have a look at this spectrum of the sun. It's been spread out incredibly long, so that they've had to split it up into dozens of smaller pieces, just so that they could fit it onto a page. Each of the dark vertical bands is an absorption line. As I just mentioned, these lines are produced by the gases in the sun's and the earth's atmospheres. As you can see, there are hundreds of lines here produced by numerous chemical elements. We call the study of spectra this way spectroscopy. Spectroscopy was first introduced in the late 19th century, and ever since then, it's been an incredibly important tool in astronomy. By allowing us to determine the chemical composition of objects in space, it has let us treat astronomical objects as more than just moving lights in the sky. Instead, these are real, physical objects that we can study just like material objects here on Earth. The modern science of astrophysics became possible from this. For example, back in the first chapter, we mentioned that Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin was able to figure out what stars were made out of by studying their light. She did this by studying the spectra of stars. Finally, I should mention that it's not just gases that produce absorption spectra. Solids and liquids do too, but they're harder to interpret. That's because they usually don't absorb discrete wavelengths of light. Instead, they tend to absorb whole bands of color. This means that many closely related materials will have spectra that look almost identical. So while it's easy to distinguish broadly different materials like ice and rock, it's much harder to figure out exactly what kind of rock or ice you might be looking at. 
So how do absorption and emission spectra form? To understand this, we need to have another look at atoms, and more particularly, at how electrons behave inside atoms. We've already seen that electrons surround the nucleus. It turns out that they can't be just anywhere around the nucleus. Instead, electrons can only be in certain levels called orbitals. These orbitals are defined by energy. If an electron is in one orbital, the only way it can jump to another orbital is by gaining or losing energy. This makes orbitals a lot like steps in a stairwell. You can stand on one step or another, but you can't stand between steps. Similarly, an electron can be in one orbital or another, but it can't be between two orbitals. When you're on a stairwell, you lose gravitational energy when you go down a step and you have to expend energy to go up a step. Similarly, for an electron to jump down to a lower orbital, it has to lose a bundle of energy. That's what the picture is showing. To get an electron to jump to a higher orbital, it has to gain a bundle of energy. Electrons gaining or losing bundles of energy causes them to jump to different orbitals. However, photons are bundles of energy, so photons can make electrons change orbitals. When an electron drops to a lower energy level, it loses energy by emitting a photon. The energy of the photon has to match the energy the electron loses to go down a level. Remember that energy of a photon is like wavelength or color. So if you know the energy gap between electron levels, you know the color it can emit. Similarly, when an electron absorbs a photon of the right energy, it jumps up a level. The photon's energy, or color, determines how much energy the electron can absorb. If there's an orbital there, then the absorption happens. This is a key idea. The electron can only absorb a photon if it has the right energy. If a photon comes along and it doesn't give the electron the right energy to go up to another orbital, the electron doesn't absorb that photon. It just goes on past. This is how an absorption spectrum is produced. Lots of different photons go through the gas, but only ones with the right energy get absorbed. Those are the dark lines in the spectrum. Similarly, an electron dropping down to a lower level can only produce photons with energies that match that energy gap. This produces an emission spectrum. The pattern of bright lines matches the energies of the photons coming from the gaps. One important difference between the orbitals of an atom and a stairwell is that the orbitals aren't all regularly spaced. Imagine a stairwell where no two steps were the same height from each other. Some steps would be huge, while others would be tiny. That's what orbitals are like. More importantly, each chemical element has a different pattern of step sizes. The pattern for hydrogen is shown here. Since each element has a different set of orbital energies, each one produces a different pattern of absorption or emission. Also notice that electrons don't just jump to the next level. They can jump one, two, three, or more levels at once, producing photons with more energy, hence shorter wavelengths, the farther they jump. Here's a table to fill in to remind yourself of the four major ways that light and matter interact. See if you can define each one without just relying on the name of the interaction. In other words, don't just say that reflection is when something reflects. Also, come up with some examples, but leave room so that you can add others as you learn about them later in the course.